For Krumah Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Today on Politics 360, political analyst Ibrahim Fakir joins me to discuss electoral politics from competition and contest to political conflict. You have raised serious concerns about problems with the ongoing process of electoral reform in South Africa. So can you explain why changes are being considered for South Africa's electoral system? What changes are being considered and why do you think that the changes may lead to conflict, legal challenges and uncertainties? Tabi, the main reason why we have sort of changes in the electoral system, or at least the bill before Parliament, is that in 2020, the Constitutional Court decided in a case brought by the New Nation Movement and others that the current electoral system is unconstitutional and therefore it must change. And it must change in the direction of allowing independent candidates to stand for election. Now, of course, the Constitutional Court said nothing more than that. And they based their reasoning, or at least the majority judgment did, on a clause in the Constitution, which is about individual political rights, which can be exercised outside of associating with political parties. Because remember, in the current system that we have of pure proportional representation at national and provincial level, require that you must be affiliated or you must appear on a political party list. So the Constitutional Court said, no, that is not uh, constitutional. We should allow individuals as as individuals without associating with a political party or some other organization to be able to stand. What that did was that it presented the society with a moment in which to overhaul the electoral system as a whole. And there's good reason why there's a need to overhaul this electoral system. For one, is that the current pure proportional representation, while it's very good in ensuring that there is inclusivity, that there's diversity, that there's sufficient representativity, it's very accommodating. It also allows space to ensure that people who are uh, disabled or women, for example, get effective representation. So it's, it's very good in those respects. But... It does mean that it leads to excessive party fragmentation because every little niche interest group, special interest group, etc., thinks they can get representation, and they do. If you look at the last few elections, you will find that roughly about seven or eight political parties share only about 15 or, or less percent of electoral support generally. Now, one is not arguing that One should have a two- or three-party system only. But there is absolutely a requirement that we should have some minimum threshold for support. That means one person doesn't just, you know, decide to form a political party and on their own interests get in. That we should have a threshold, and that's I see that argument is now being advanced. But the second is that the party bosses enjoyed a lot of power and influence uh, over their party caucuses. Their party caucuses didn't allow individuals to exercise their own discretion in judgment. And that meant that you would have much less accountability and you had much less responsiveness. But you also had much less oversight of the legislature. That means independent parliaments, uh, provincial legislatures, local councils exercising oversight over officials and over the executive where decisions are actually implemented, budgets are spent and so on. And so you had poor oversight, poor responsiveness, poor accountability. And that toxic mix has left us with things like state capture, with very uh, powerful political parties, but which are fragmented and which are fragmenting further. And in the context in which there is so much interest in holding political office or being an official in government because it's the only route to economic survival, so to speak. The stakes are very high. So people compete for these positions. And, you know, if there's a risk of you losing out, and we've seen this happen in every election where there's internal fights among an internal competition, 
uh, which is not just competition, it borders on conflict, where if you are not going to be the local ward councillor or you're not high enough on a party's PR list, there's actually political violence. We've also seen things like target assassinations and so on, even though that have to do with in some cases, whistleblowers and so on, the risk of that infecting the political environment, which it already has, by the way, is extremely high. Now, in response to your question, what is Parliament considering? Well, Parliament went through a process of having this electoral reform to comply with what the Constitutional Court said. But in the first instance, they missed the deadline. So they had to apply for an extension. When the extension was granted, they're still kind of dragging their feet. And it's October now. They're only passing that bill at present. In the two years that they had, or even two and a half years, they had very haphazard, lopsided, inadequate public consultation on this. They didn't even know, the MPs, the parliament, the political parties that make up the parliament, didn't even know what the Constitutional Court was, in fact, asking them for, because I attended the first committee meeting and I heard MPs asking the IEC to come up with a system, which is completely mind-boggling because the court said Parliament must come up with the system. Now, one understands that, of course, the political parties would be voting for a system which would have an existential crisis for many of them, because without a pure proportional representation system, many of them, in fact, the majority of parties from the third largest party down would, in fact, be a shadow of their current selves. Um, in terms of representation in the legislature. So there's an existential crisis for them in, in going through this exercise. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that in the, in the intervening period, they relied on a ministerial advisory committee, which was looking into the electoral system in the executive to come up with the systems. And the ministerial advisory committee had public hearings, they had consultations, and the members of that committee came up with two systems. And the parliament, unfortunately, decided to opt for the least desirable of those systems, which is a very minimalist, compliance-driven approach rather than a reformist approach. And this compliance-driven approach means that they want to have an electoral system in which the current system is largely retained. It will simply accommodate individ individuals as independents who will tag on to the ballot paper uh, in each province and nationally. So you will get the normal ballot paper as you do with the list of all the political parties and each individual who wants to stand as an, as an independent will, will have their names tagged on and you will go to the election as per normal. That has serious drawbacks. First is you are asking independents to compete on equal footing with political parties. Second, is that the number of votes that an independent gets if the threshold that they meet, which is unfair because the threshold for them to meet will be higher than the threshold for political parties, right? Hence, again, another unfairness. But it also means that the votes cast in excess of what they require to hold a seat above the threshold will be wasted. So there's deep inherent problems with the current system that the, the parliament has, has adopted. Um, that's the short answer to your question. The slightly expanded answer is that the potential for conflict is high because parties are fractious as it is. We see they moan, they make every problem, everyone else's problem but theirs. They externalize their inability to contain their own internal conflicts. They externalize the fact that they don't perform as well as they promise their supporters, members or people or, or the society in general. And they scapegoat that by saying, no, it's other people's fault. You know, the system was broken. Uh, the IEC didn't administer things properly and so on. Now, if you are so late in the day passing a whole new electoral system, all of the administrative and management arrangements that the IEC needs to make to host and facilitate the 2024 elections are in jeopardy because there's a lot of work to be done, ranging from logistics, preparations, planning, training of officials, training of party agents and individuals, registration of those who are going to be uh, part of the electoral contest, voter registration, so on. 
including education and so on. Then there's also the logistics and planning and contracting for voting stations, uh, materials, balloting materials, all those administrative requirements, the planning, the logistics, the management, the administration, require at least three, three and a half years to prepare. If you only pass this bill at the end, and it's a new system, at the end of 2022, you are imperiling the planning processes and the preparation processes of the IEC. And obviously, mistakes are going to creep in. And parties, conflictual and fractious as they are, one might even add immature as they are, are likely to raise these issues and elevate them to a point of conflict. Um, and hence, I was saying that, that it's really irresponsible of the way in which both the parties have behaved and the way in which Parliament has approached this question of electoral reform. And over the past two decades, Ibrahim, South Africa has experienced a sharp decline in voter participation. So why do you think this has been happening and what do you think can be done? Well, I mean, we've got to get to the reason why there's declining voter participation in elections. Now, that's not equivalent to saying that voters are, and people in society are apathetic, that they're not politically interested. That that would be untrue. They are. They are quite interested in politics. People take an active interest. They contribute to discussions. You can hear it, you know, all over the show. Uh, you can see active political participation in all kinds of things, from protests to all kinds of other movements and activities in society. So it's not that the that people are apathetic and that they don't care. So this is not about apathy. This is about a lack of interest and a lack of a stake, uh, a lack of thinking that I am properly represented in the system. And you simply need to look at the levels of confidence in public institutions generally. And they are extremely low and they are declining very fast. If you take political parties as part of those established institutions, the trust in political parties across the board is extremely low. Uh, in fact, it's lower than for all other institutions in society. Uh, and that has meant that over time, people have believed and thought that the process of democratic institutions and what purpose they serve is not for us. It is about politicians and those in power uh, and the elites uh, in corporates and elsewhere using these institutions to mediate their own problems, their own concerns, their own interests, their own desires. That's what these are here for. Because, And you see it in the way in which there's infighting, in which they assume to be standing and fighting for principle, but that principle has nothing to do with the voters and everything to do with the interests of parties and party leaders. So there's been a very sharp decline in trust levels in public institutions and political parties specifically, which is the basic driver of um, lower voter turnout. Now, of course, some people say, oh, no, if you have better civic education and you have more voter education and you have more voter outreach and you do more of these kind of communication activities, voter turnout will go up. That is completely untrue. The IEC and others in society, including in civil society, do a lot of voter education, a lot of citizen education, a lot of democratic education, a lot of outreach for that matter, even campaigning uh, and communications. So that can't be the reason. The reason is squarely the lack of trust in institutions and the lack of trust and confidence in political parties that drives voter turnout down. And that is a big problem for democracy because it means it's raising questions about the credibility of these institutions and the legitimacy of those who hold power. So what can be done to better connect politics with the needs of our society and citizens? Well, there's plenty that needs to be done. For one, I think voters need to take um, much and, and they, as you know, I'm saying that they are politically interested, but they need to take a stronger interest on in what happens in the parties, firstly. Secondly, uh, it's not that people aren't active, but they need to be more active uh, politically and socially. Third is to ensure that there is better communication and better discernment in the choice you make about who you choose to represent you in parliament or in provincial legislatures or in local councils for that matter. Fourth is to be more active in the many sites of participatory democracy of which there are many, such as 
the uh, integrated planning processes, such as the community policing forums, such as ward committees, um, or taking interest in public hearings and public submissions, which happen at Parliament. Now, that's no panacea, because we know that those processes have inbuilt inherent barriers. Number one, there is a language and a process dimension to them. Second, there's a resource dimension to them. So you need resources to be able to participate in it. You need familiarity with the technical material that they uh, are going to grapple with. You need the ability to understand the process of, of how it works and so on. So those are barriers to entry, but they are not insurmountable. And so that's the first set of things um, that need to happen. But more importantly, is for voters to be much more discerning about who they choose, why they choose them, and how they expect those people to be not necessarily accountable, but at least at the bare minimum responsive. It's once you build and have responsiveness that you will start to have accountability to communities. So what's been the problem of responsiveness? The problem of responsiveness, and this is a popular adage, you hear people say, we see people and we hear people when they want our vote and then they disappear. But that's because they are unresponsive to you. Uh, people have tried to get councillors and politicians to be more responsive through protests, through strikes. Sometimes it's debilitating and destructive because people engage in behaviour which destroys public property, public institutions and so on. That's not that's one way, uh, but and protest is one way. But surely it means that if the politicians are being unresponsive, we're choosing and electing the wrong kinds of people. Some people say one way out of this is to regulate the entry of those who want to stand for office. So we should have qualifications criteria. That doesn't necessarily always work uh, because it over-bureaucratizes politics. Lastly, is those people we elect into office, their job, even though they are responsive to us, must conduct and we expect responsiveness on the basis of them conducting better oversight over the officials who are supposed to do the actual service delivery. Better oversight and extract accountability from those in the executive who have been elected to oversee, supervise and manage the budgets and processes of service delivery of performance of the public service. So we must force the people we elect to be better at conducting oversight and extracting accountability from officials, whether it be at the municipal level, about maintenance of basic infrastructure, of services, of the rollout of those and the management of those entities, or whether it be about health, education, policing at national and provincial level. And lastly, Ibrahim, can you briefly explain to us why you think coalition government are so unstable in the country? You know, again, people believe that the coalitions are a natural outcome. I, I'm not so sure. I think we should wait for every election and after every election on the basis of the results that we got. Now, part of the problem for why coalitions have been unstable, apart from the throwaway point that, you know, they are fairly new and they are fairly new creatures. We've only seen them start appearing from 2016 onwards properly. But in, in large part, many of these are not necessarily coalitions, but they are minority governments, which means that a government has been formed by a party which has been able to cobble together agreements with a bunch of others to put them into power and to hold uh, the reins of power and authority for that period. Uh, and if they, as we have seen, whimsically decide to withdraw it, that government will fall. So effectively, they are minority governments. Coalitions would be parties who decide to come together, work together on the basis of a commonly set of agreed principles, programs, and policies uh, that they hammer out. And coalitions are possible, even from parties and with parties which are ideologically disparate, which believe different things, as long as they can define a common minimum program for what they want to do. Now, many of these would center around what would be the expenditure areas in which you want to focus, and you hammer that out as an agreement, and then you ensure that you conduct oversight over those areas of the officials who must carry out those things. So that's the first. The second is which are the policy areas we're going to focus on and, and why? Which are the constituencies in society 
that we're going to do this to and, and, and in what way. Now, if you think of the way in which parties behaved, none of those considerations have actually featured in their discussions. It has always been about what is in the interest of the party, which portfolios are we going to get. The agreement that they struck was just that, you know, you will vote for us for this position, we will hold that position, we will be in the majority, this is what you will get, this is what we will get. And then as a byproduct, a very distant second set of considerations would be why we're we going to do this, for which areas and so on. So that has to be reversed if you want these to be more sustainable. So that's the first set of problems. The second set of problems, why they haven't really worked, is, let's be frank, we don't have a commitment to basic values in the society. People who make agreements will be very, very easily break them. So they make these agreements in bad faith. So they make bad faith agreements. They, uh, made, they make agreements on the basis of brinkmanship and expediency. And it's the, on the basis of expediency and brinkmanship that they withdraw from it. And that leads to a great degree of destabilization. That leads to a great degree of destruction uh, of the public institutions themselves. But it means that those institutions don't know. The officials who people those institutions don't know about what their mandate is. Now, if you think about what I was just talking to you about just now about conducting oversight, those officials feel completely unrooted because no one is conducting effective oversight over them. No one is in the elected office to know who must conduct oversight over who, who am I responsible and accountable to, and therefore the politicians are unresponsive to us as citizens because we've allowed them to get away with this. So that's the, that's the second reason, bad faith and uh, a lack of commitment or lack of fidelity to common values, common, common everyday things such as truthfulness, honesty, commitment. Now, of course, there are instances in which, you know, agreements you make, even in good faith, and, and here I'm saying they've made them in bad faith to start with, but even agreements made in good faith can run aground, they can run into problems. So you would have coalition agreements which would have mechanisms to arbitrate the differences and the conflicts. So what they would call conflict-breaking mechanisms must be included in these kind of coalition agreements that you agree. And then lastly, one you know, one way out of this, people say, is you can regulate them better. You should have better law and you should have law which will regulate how these things must happen. And and, and, and they have um, suggestions like the largest party should have the right to form government and that all uh, portfolios must be distributed in proportion to the support that parties got in a election. Now, again, listen carefully to the proposals, what the, the proportion that parties got. So again, it's the parties which are accommodated in the system as if the democratic system exists only to accommodate and to facilitate and to cater to the interests of the party, no, not thinking about the voter. Now, in some way, some of these suggestions are valuable and useful, but they will run into a problem because every regulatory system has loopholes in it. Every regulatory system has ways in which they can be broken or sinews through which you can navigate out of them. And at the best of times, South Africans are a non-compliant society. So if you think if we can break normal criminal laws with the kind of willfulness that we do, that there will suddenly be a respect for these new set of uh, legal requirements and regulations that you put in place, that's a little bit of pie in the sky thinking. So I don't think that better regulation may be one way, but I don't think that will be the panacea. We need a change in values, number one, that if you go negotiate into these agreements, do them in good faith, have basic commitments as a start just to honesty, to truthfulness, to faithfulness. Then have the higher order things of constructing a common set of agendas uh, 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 some kind of common minimum policy program and platform, some kind of agenda for where you would want to spend money and what what oversight will be conducted um, in those areas so that it becomes to lead to the third change, a change not just in values, but a change in orientation, that the orientation is less about the parties and accommodating their interests, but the value and the interest of voters. Uh, how will they best be served? 
uh, whatever agreements we make as parties. That was Ibrahim Fakir speaking to Krima Media's polity about electoral politics from competition and contest to political conflict. Thank <music> you.